personal reasons to, to Mallorca. So Javier is a, is a professor, a professor titular of uh, mathematical statistics and statistic processes in the Department of Mathematics in the University of Salamanca. But he he's a, and was trained as a physicist, as a, but I must say that in, 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 in theoretical physics in Salamanca, physicist, I mean a mathematical physicist in, in that sense is quite mathematical, <laughs> it's not like in, in other places. So Javier uh, has worked for many years on uh, solution, solutions of uh, models in particle physics, well, this was in his thesis, for instance, the Young Mills model. Then he went to the University of Colorado at Boulder to work with, uh, with the real Mark Abrams, the real leader of the field for was two or three years, I don't remember. Yes. And then has been returning for maybe 15 or 18 years every summer for one or two months. And, and there he worked on uh, all kinds of solutions so from the uh, total lattice to, to, to cut himself uh, Petias Vili and finding all kinds of fancy <laughs> solutions. And more recently, he has started doing research in the, in the, in the, the area of his teaching, that is uh, stochastic processes, and <laughs> has worked a lot on stochastic finance and, and something like that. that I, uh, in principle, I thought that was the, <laughs> the topic that you were preferred today, and uh, I said, Maxi, and this is what you have instead preferred to, to talk on this topic, but you say, I mean, you can switch between, well, it's in two, uh, same dog will be different colors. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me first uh, thank uh, all the people here, Professor Miguel and Manuel, for inviting me over. I'm very glad to be here. Well, today I will be talking, uh, the title of the talk, as you see, is the, has to do with the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and driving by uh, Poisson noise and application of this, uh, of this to the distribution of impurities that occur at random in an optical pattern. And I have, this is part of, uh, of the work that I have been doing with Professor Montero. He's from the Universitat de Barcelona, the Central University. Yes. Um, well, this talk is a part <coughs> of our research uh, line, which from the last few years has been around the the theory of point processes and the application of these ideas, these mathematical ideas, um, point processes with drift, actually, to uh, several fields. Uh, one of them is the theory of discrete fractional diffusion processes in statistical physics. Um, other uh, topics that we have been um, involved with are, as Manuel was pointing out, the theory uh, mathematical finance theory in which uh, catastrophes occur, and also risk theory, so risk theory, um, risk theory, the pragmatic modeling in, in insurance and risk <coughs> is what is called a point process with drift. And also, uh, we de develop uh, some application to some to a topic in multiple physics, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, concretely to to, to optics. But let me first define what the point process oops, point process with brief is. A point process or a jump process um, is an stochastic process which um, is uh, defined by a piecewise constant function like this here. So here um, you have well Okay, so this function is made up of two terms, this and this. This is what is called a jump or point process, and this is a constant function by intervals. So, but then it has jumps of magnitude gamma j at some points t sub n. So <coughs> this is a classical point process. Then we want to add a constant term here gamma t, gamma is a constant, so this is a linear function in t. Therefore, you end up with a function which is piecewise linear, instead of a piecewise constant. So the point process is defined by this constant, and then also several 
sequences of random numbers, the gamma sub n and the t sub n. Okay. And just to correct it, random are the gammas and the t's, both of them. Yeah, both of them. So, yeah, yeah, both the amplitude and the time at which they are the jump of So the jumps are always upwards. Jumps are always upwards. Yes, <coughs> always upwards. So, um, well, actually, the, the, the signs are tricky here. So to, to be definite, notice that both the gammas and the t's are positive. The jumps are the gamma, so they are positive. And then what remains here to play with is the sign there. Can go both ways, and they are quite different depending on what sign do you have. For example, in Greek theory, uh, the sign that occurs is the minus. Here in my application, it's going to be the, the plus, and that uh, makes life simpler. Okay, at any rate. So if you uh, so if you want to uh, see what uh, this kind of processes look like, uh, here is a plot. The green line is the function s of t that I was uh, referring before. Here are the t sub n's, t1, t2. As you see at the points between <coughs> t sub n's, the function is, is a linear function, and then at the t sub n's there is a jump. So this magnitude is gamma 1, gamma 2, and so on. OK, I will have to more to tell about this, uh, this uh, figure later on. But let me continue further. <coughs> so let's, the, the question I want to uh, consider today, uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, is uh, defined by the left hand side of this here. So if, that, if you equal this to zero, then you obtain nonlinear Schrodinger equation or NLS for sure. As you see, it's a, a two dimensional TD. It depends on two variables, X and T. Usually, X is a space and T is time. But in optics, actually, the, the variables are reversed. So I may end up uh, calling, uh, speaking of T as either time or space because of the difference in process. And then you have a Cubic nonlinearity. Well, actually, this is probably you're more fam more familiar with the Kings Google and Tower equation. This is a just a particular election of, of constants. Everything is linear here. <coughs> so, to this basic structure, I am going to uh, superpose um, the loss term like this here, where gamma is a positive constant. So this is going to account for losses. <coughs> and then, also, I am adding this kind of perturbation, where, again, t sub n and gamma sub n are random numbers. Capital gamma is a, a, is a positive a constant, but it's, it is the loss coefficient. <coughs> now, um, the claim... When you call that loss, that equation is still conservative. No, because there is not that I experiment in the US. No. no. The nonlinear line could be conservative. Yes. No, yes, no, yes. So that is this term. Okay. Okay. So this is dissipation. Allowing the term. Dumping term. Okay. And the U plus? What do you mean? Oh, U minus here, yes. No, no, in the, in the equation. <coughs> Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, that's okay. Maybe you mean this? No, 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 no. no, no. Okay. Okay. So <coughs> I claim that this equation can be useful to describe um, can, can have a, a, a variant in optics, and it is because of the in the following connection. Well, first, uh, NLS without uh, all the stuff before, um, with the zero on the right hand side, was introduced by Sahar in the uh, 29, I seem to report. And he proved that this equation models uh, the amplitude of water waves, the complex amplitude of water waves uh, under some circumstances. And then, uh, around the 80s, 
Hasegawa, Hasegawa, Kodama, and a certain number of authors prove that this equation also models the, 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 the uh, propagation of uh, optical fiber pulses in nonlinear fibers. <coughs> so after that, and the interest in that equation has increased quite a lot because it's a fundamental equation in several fields. Without the right hand side, this equation is what is called an integrable equation. That means that it, is, it has polyton solutions and trains of solitons. And more generally, you can solve any initial value problem for this equation. So if you put initial data here, you can obtain in an analytic way uh, the solution to the equation, only by the analytical procedure. It's actually difficult and tricky procedure, but you can do it. <coughs> then, some point out it shows in optics. In optics, they usually um, introduce several perturbation terms to account for scalized features, like the dissipation here. And now, if you also add um, the Poisson noise, which is this uh, derived random cone here, I what the claim <coughs> is that this could also be of physical interest. Actually, the introduction of uh, Poisson noise is a standard in some, for example, in neural science. They use this to, to model the, the firing of neurons, the electrical firing. So this kind of field is more or less standard, but has not, uh, to our knowledge, been introduced in, say, optics. Now, the way this can account for some physical effect in optics is the following. <coughs> if you have a field that follows this equation, then because of the deltas at points t sub n, the ingoing and outgoing amplitude will um, suffer a jump. So the input, which I call like this, at the point t sub n, will decrease in a sharp way to an output value, UTN plus, which is related with the limit from the left by this relationship. So therefore, points T sub n may um, be points at which some impurities occur in the fiber. And because of these impurities, the amplitude is dim in an abrupt way. Uh, so therefore, gamma sub n is a dim ratio for the amplitude. Okay. So this is the, the interpretation um, of all this. So I may be I may speak of the T sub n as jump points or impurities. <coughs> and the equation will be describing uh, an optical pulse in a fiber that has a deterministic loss, a constant deterministic loss, but also has impurities that have occurred in the production, say, of the fiber and have occurred uh, randomly. The positions are given by the points T sub n. Recall that this T in optics is a space, an X sign. It's the only way around. So the, what you want to do is to um, solve this equation, or solve or gain as much information as possible on this equation. Um, to do that, then, well, First, you have to consider several assumptions on the on the different um, the sequences t sub n and gamma sub n. Sorry, I'm yes. completely confused. Can you go to the, to the equation? So you said t is is t is time or no? T is space. But then the, the upper the left side of the equation. I mean, the, you have a first derivative with respect to t. That should be time. Uh, no, it's confusing Fabinci. because they, they put in a reference frame which moves together with the pulse in the fiber. Yeah. And then and then what this derivative with respect to x t is in this part is chromatic dispersion. And the derivative with respect to t accounts for the for the change in that. Okay. So when you do that, you basically move together with the pulse and look at what happens in that reference frame. It's confusing, but uh, people are fine. <coughs> Fluid dynamics is time, and this is a standard uh, evolution equation, not in optics, because as Per was pointing out, to do 
clips on clips on this is um I think we have someone here in charge of helping with that. <laughs> <laughs> Here are the assumptions I will be taking about the, the deltas and, and the gammas that occur here. This is the most crude assumptions. They are the standard uh, assumptions, you not high enough uh, models where you have this kind of setup. Actually, you reason not on the T sub n, but on the relative distances between the T sub n. <coughs> so you assume first that uh, if you call delta sub n, the distances, then that the delta sub n are um, independent, identically distributed random variables. This does not mean that they are all the same, only that they have the same uh, statistic or probability distribution. And the same with the gammas. <coughs> you must assume that they are independent, identically distributed random variables. The funny symbol here uh, is also um, supposed to stand for independence. So again, the gammas and the deltas are independent. They have nothing to do whatsoever. Now, um, statistical independence uh, means the following. So what you are assuming is that this distance has nothing to do with this, or with the whole, or with the next one, and so forth. <coughs> They are, so the interpretation of this independence assumption is that knowing uh, at what distance has T1 occurred will give you no information whatsoever on the possible value of this new distance and so forth. So all the data that you can collect um, in the past for looking at what has occurred before the, the actual impurity you are interested in gives you no information at all to predict the new the position of the new impurity. Okay? Once you know the probability distribution that you take in the model for this, then all the information that you can collect on past performance, on past values of the tissue event is going to give you no gain of information. That this is the meaning of the new values. And the same with the gammas. If this one has been very small, that doesn't imply that this is one is going to be small at all. You cannot infer anything from knowing that. And so statistical independence actually has a meaning of having no influence at all. So, um, we take first this as a basic assumption. Now I also assume the so-called memory as property. This is also a standard in statistical mechanics. Um, from a mathematical point of view, it means that this, uh, sorry, these things are going to be exponentially distributed with mean call it 1 over lambda, lambda is a certain parameter. So all of the, these uh, terms are going to have this probability distribution. This, has, this actually implies that if you call n of t or n sub t the number of the effects that have, in q, that have occurred up to t, then n t uh, has a Poisson distribu distribution with parameter lambda t. It's a well-known uh, fact in the statistical physics and the theory of the stochastic process. The memory-less property um, has the following meaning. Suppose that you um, observe the, how this function unfolds in time, and you take a given time like this here, and so far, no impurity has occurred. Okay. Then, having this information gives you, again, no information whatsoever to predict where is going to occur the first jump. Okay. So 
So the fact that you know that for a very long time no impurity has occurred does not make doesn't make it more or less like uh, likable that an impurity is going to occur. So in a sense it resembles the former property, but notice that here this only refers to one of these things while the other refer to how different distances relate. <coughs> so these are um, the assumptions I'm going to consider in, in, in my model. And they are, as I'm trying to tell you, they are quite reasonable from a physical perspective. Um, unless you want to, to develop a very refined model, you will always assume something like this. It's only when you want to go from the simplest model to more and more refined models that you begin to allow for correlations between the different variables. So again, this, uh, these are not very, these are rather weak assumptions. They, you can be more or less confident that to a very good degree they will hold in most physical situations one considered here. If you are talking of the fiber, the fact that a defect occurred in a certain point doesn't make it more like more likely that a defect a new defect is going to occur soon. It happened wherever they, they did. Okay, so let's go further. So now let's uh, now we want to tackle this equation. And what we did is to suppose that the field U uh, splits can be split like a product of this form. Is it because you mentioned to see the several kinds of this as a so valid in the physical movement matrix. You mean the method of solution of the equation can be mapped with the physical movement? No, 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 no. no. It, it's only that uh, for, for that equation. Uh, People have considered this kind of noise in that connection. But not, not, uh, no, 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 not the method of solution. Actually, it is a deterministic equation. No, no. Well, it, it was a surprise to me to realize that uh, you can use this uh, splitting and to a certain point be able to solve this, the equation that you have here. Usually, these equations are very difficult to deal with. So, here is the the basic answer. I assume that U can be split like this, where the first term C of T depends only on time, but not on X, only on T, but not on X, and it's got jumps at T sub N. And now, V is going to depend on both T and X, but, and this is the, the, the important assumption, V is, we require that V be continuous, that it has no jumps. Okay? So if you um, stick these ansatz into again into this equation one, see, one can see that this is traded for solving <coughs> the following equations first you have this equation for V this is some sort of time dependent NLS you then have this here then this would be again nonlinear Schrodinger but then you have this term C, C squared of T so this is a modified form of NLS. And this on the one hand, while on the other, C of T satisfies this. And notice that uh, the deltas are only, only influence this equation, but not this, not this one here. And actually, it's interesting to point out that this is uh, the same than um, an equation that occurs in, in stochastic calculus for jump processes. Usually in, in this kind of um, in mathematical finance or risk theory, you don't write something uh, like this, but you write this, an equation for the differentials, and then you have here a funny differential, uh, the differential of the Poisson process, which itself is a, a piecewise constant process. But at any rate, when, when they, in mathematical finance, write something like this, it's the same as this. So, 
point is that we end up with the equation, with the basic equation in Yam uh, stochastic finance. What happened to the gamma? What? What happened to the gamma? It's going to three. What is the gamma? Uh, the here. Here. Oh, here. Yes. Because, because the same for all the four points. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, that's the thing. This this notation is too short to, to, to have here an index because you don't have a sum. So you write it on this four, actually. And, and I mean, written like this, this doesn't, it's just a formal equation. This doesn't mean anything. gamma of t? No, gamma depends on the nm. Right, so downstairs, it's what you have. It was a constant, and then it has jumps. It has to, has to do with the Poisson. No, the ends has to do with the Poisson of the solution. I think it's it important to take that all the gamma are the same. No, no, no. no. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what is this except at the jump times. Uh, the jump times is the yeah. gamma. Yeah. 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 And outside this is relevant what this is exactly. because it's multiplied by Tn, yeah. which is it. Yeah. Yeah. No, but <laughs> I think mean, inside the jump, how much which one will it the, 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 the Just the, the pre-jump pre time. That's yeah. the so standard possible process. This, this is differential is zero set up the jump times. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you integrate, you only see what happens at jump times, and then this will give you an end there. <laughs> But that's a funny way to, to write things. If you want to to understand what this means, either you use some uh, heavy measure theory or just stick to this, which is much easier to understand. Well, nevertheless, this is called the Merton um, jump equation. And oops, here you can solve it. Uh, you can solve it again looking at how different C, how C uh, at jump times uh, relates. And the solution is given by this formula in terms of the exponential of the certain function where and this function S of t happens to be this, which is the kind of point processor we treat I was talking at the, at, the, at the start of the talk. Here again, n of t is the number of impurities that occur in zero t. Um, this is again the same uh, plot. Here in the green line you see S of t, while the red one um, represents the function C of t, e to the minus S of t. Only this one is piecewise linear. This may look linear by intervals, but it is not. It looks uh, linear only because the gamma here is very small, so the exponential is well approximated by a squared line. But this is actually is not linear. Okay, so this but can you solve the equation for S given that you know that well, as you said, it's a definition. No, go back to the equation. Yeah. 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 You want to you want to get the the sheet? Yeah. You want to plug it into the V equation? Yeah, yeah. I will go to that later. Oh no, okay, that was all. So I'm considering first. I thought you were putting the V as well. No, no, no. That was the S. I'm putting. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Sorry, I thought it was This cannot be solved. I mean, you cannot solve that equation, but still you can do all the things with it. And that's the, the whole thing. And here are several references which are uh, to a point um, related with this. Shaharov is the original reference for MLS. Hasegawa and Kodama were the ones who introduced and uh, showed that Another set of models, uh, the propagation of pulses in optical fibers, and have been done a lot of work in uh, rapid communication systems. Merton is, is a very famous economist. I don't know whether you are familiar with the Black and Scholes formula. And they were given awarded the Nobel Prize for, by their work in. Uh, Finance derivatives, Merton, 
also work with Black and Souls, and he also did use at the same time the famous Black and Souls formula. But he was a little less lucky, so he, didn't, he was awarded the, the prize. But still, he's a very um, important person in all this case. Tackle is a classical reference for the applications of all this kind of stuff, for some noise in neuroscience. And here is some of the work we have been doing um, as of lately. Um, and actually, the, what I'm talking about here is um, appears in Journal of Physics B. This is B. This is um, devoted to optics mostly. And also, this article is already available on, online. So here we develop the more uh, mathematical details of, of, of this one. Now, here is the B equation. Um, this equation is nonlinear, it's got a cubic nonlinearity, and also a time dependence, uh, an explicit time dependence in it. But still, if you take gamma to be zero, then this equation can be solved in an analytic way. I mean, the procedure is very tricky. You don't think that you can come up with a very simple, nice formula that will cover uh, every situation. You have to, for Every initial condition, you have to repeat the procedure. But at any point, it can be done. But if you take the general case that I'm interested in, gamma non-zero, then it is not miserable. So it means you only, all you can do is to resort to numerical methods. But no, there's nothing to be said about an analytic way, in principle. <coughs> um, but, in spite of this, it turns out that the basic physical observables, like the energy of the wave, can be studied. And more, most physical pro properties of interest can be determined in an exact way. And this is what I want to focus upon. So here, I will consider several natural physical problems. Here are the basic, uh, what I call the basic physical observables. This is the. What do you mean by natural? Not artificial? <laughs> well, that's. I mean. Or, or natural quantities. quantities natural are. quantities. Yes. So this is the energy of the field. And this is the momentum. Uh, of course, this stands for the complex uh, conjugate. And this is a derivative here. And the position of the field is defined on this way. So what I'll try to do next is, even though I'm not able to solve the equation for B, but still I can determine the evolution of these uh, functions, and then pose problems related with them. So suppose you want to obtain the evolution of the energy, and then you can then you, natural thing again to do would be consider, to consider the energy density, namely this factor here, and try to derive an equation for the energy density. Okay. But because of the deltas on this equation, uh, formal manipulations to, to derive uh, an evolution equation for this are not possible. So you are stuck there. But again, the trick is to go uh, and not to consider this, but instead consider this, the square of B. Okay? And because B satisfies an equation which is far nicer and doesn't have deltas in it, then you can obtain a simple uh, continuity equation for, the, for this energy density, like this. Now, if you suppose that uh, the field V is vanishing at infinity, which is a standard assumption and it's natural on a physical perspective. Then you can integrate this on X, and, and therefore this will uh, vanish at infinity, this term, because it's a total derivative. So you obtain that this term is conserved in time, and therefore going from U to V, which amounts to multiply by the factor C of T, you obtain the evolution of the energy. And you obtain this simple formula for the evolution of the energy. And something similar for the evolution of the momentum 
and position. So it's a very uh, nice and simple formula. And it's also remarkable that the energy, the energy, the dynamics of the energy does not depend on speed. So even if you don't know this field, then I mean you don't need to, to know V to, to to obtain uh, how the energy evolves. The momentum or the position. And because of this, we can skip the difficult part and still play a, a few games with all this. So but it is natural that the energy does not depend on me. You think so? Well if there is no the, there is no gamma energy does not evolve. No, it still evolves because of the of the jumps. It will be constant by by intervals. But I mean if there is no losses. Oh there, there is no losses, yes. And all the losses are contained in S. Yeah, but V is uh, what is this? Well V yeah, but if you go is continuous, so I mean, no, but that means that if you don't have this thing that you're putting in the NLS, mm -hmm. E is an energy. Yeah. So it does not depend on B because B is what remains if you don't have this. No. <laughs> 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 to me, it's not here. And then if you consider other um, functionals for that equation, higher order functionals, then going past from this one, they are going to depend on him. So it's, in a certain sense, at least to me, it's a miracle that these two do not depend on you. But, but again, what Max is saying is how that you integrate the next, so you go from considering the spatial distribution of the way, and just continue considering a, a process which is purely temporal. Mm -hmm. So for instance, what would be the result if you start from the beginning and you remove the second limited with respect to x. What would you get for the point? Well, then you can integrate. Uh, so would you end up with the same solution for the total energy? And sure. So considering the case of which is all the way They don't, it, it doesn't depend on x. That's a solution. If you continue the solution, then what will be the evolution of the, the energy, the total energy? And what well, then it has to be the same. Yeah, then what makes it say? <laughs> okay. So not the energy, but the lock of the energy is the point process with which the kind of um, Montero and I we have been working with for a long time. So we decided that we cannot supply our ideas here, and therefore we put forward several problems. I want to consider here two of these problems. <coughs> now, um, the basic um, physical observable to me is the energy. So I want to, um, as I'm saying, consider energy pro several energy problems. You can take this initial energy to be one, but no loss of generality. Now, fix a point T. Also, in the near future, I will consider a reliability level, call it E1, which is less or equal than the initial value. That's why I define a quantity B through this relationship. Now, what I, what I want to do is the first problem is to determine the mean energy at, at any time t. By mean, I, I mean I mean, I, I understand the statistical average of the energy, okay? because the energy is a random quantity. It depends on C in, on S of T, which is random. Okay? So what we wanted to do is to obtain the statistical average of this, of this thing. And I use this standard notation to, to, to denote the mean of, of the energy. Now, a more difficult problem is to determine what I call the half-life. Half-life is the following. Given this uh, reli reliability level, um, by half-life, I understand the distance 
denoted like this, which <coughs> the energy degrades to or below P1. So it is the smallest time that satisfies this. Okay. Or in terms of the function S, uh, that satisfies this. So here, oh, yeah, the thing is that uh, you see very, it's immediate to realize that this exit time, excuse me, the half-life is just an exit time for the process, for this stochastic process S of T, to go off this interval. So you can codify this problem in terms of exit uh, times for stochastic processes. So here. So now again here I have chosen um, E naught to be one. C is the square root, C of T is the square root of the energy. So I'm taking E1 to be a uh, one fourth, and therefore uh, it corresponds in, in the C plane to, to one half. So the problem is to determine the distance at which C of T uh, takes this value or goes below this value. Okay, so it, it is a quarter of the initial of the starting energy. Um, in this realization, in this sample path of the process, this distance, of course, is uh, this time here. Pretty much like uh, three point half or something like this. Okay. Uh, of course, this is a random quantity, so this is just a possible realization of the process. If you run again the situation, you run again the, 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 the situation with new randomness, then a, a different value of this variable will arise and every time you, you run the, the thing you will obtain different values so again the first problem I want to consider is for a fixed time like this to obtain the mean value, the average value of the energy and the second is for a fixed threshold value E1 that here is 1 4 to obtain this distance at which the energy uh, degrades to that value or below that value. <coughs> and again, here are my, my assumptions. I remind you that uh, the assumption regarding the independence and equal distribution of the relative distances and the gammas and independence between deltas and gammas. This is the memory less properties. Uh, delta, in mathematical terms, is given by this. And delta sub n is called an exponential distribution. Or so more clearly, that the probability that delta sub n is bigger with, uh, or equal to 1t is given by this problem. And now I'm going to take uh, also a similar uh, assumption on the gammas. I assume that the gammas have also an exponential distribution. This assumption is not, um, cannot be justified on physical grounds. But it's mathematical convenience. It's the simplest uh, assumption I can take. But most likely, if you try to, to see whether this fits with some physical situation, uh, there, I mean, there is no reason for this to fit with any uh, physical situation. But still, it's mathematically convenient. Actually, we have worked in uh, far more general cases on this. But here I think this, this is enough and we don't need to, to go to more complication. Well, now the thing is that in this case to obtain exit times uh, can be reduced to linear integral equations. And this in turn can be solved in an exact way. And this is what I'm trying to solve. First let us consider the mean energy. So I have to evaluate the mean of this quantity. Now, as a stance, this is difficult to evaluate, but if you want to evaluate this, this means the mean of this, when you know that at time t uh, there has half occurred n impurities, then this is much simpler. The mean given this information. Okay? Because in that case, uh, the S process, if you fix n to be n, smaller 
So again, here, if n is fixed to be a, a given number, then the randomness in, in this quantity is only arising from the small gammas, but not from this term here. Okay, so it's simpler to evaluate the, the mean energy, which is uh, the mean of this when you already know this. So this is the strategy. You first evaluate the mean given that you suppose that this has occurred. So therefore you have to evaluate the mean of this. And because of the independence, this, uh, this financial factors as a, as a product, and then the average of the product is just the product of the average. So therefore you end up with this formula. It's given in terms of the, uh, the mean of this uh, gamma 1 to the power n, which is very easy. Now you still don't have this, so you have now to up take a further average on n. And remember that n uh, is, uh, is Poisson distributed. So you use this and eventually you obtain the answer. And the answer is that the energy, the mean energy, decays exponentially with the rate given here. Okay, so it's a very uh, clear cut answer. Very, very nice. Now you could uh, think that you could now obtain the half-life or the mean half-life from here if you formally said, say this, you want to make this equal to E1, plug it here and then invert for T, then you obtain that the mean half time is this. So you have any possible answer. But it turns out that this is not correct. It's not correct. It would have been correct in a deterministic situation, but not when there is randomness in it. Because essentially it amounts <coughs> to first take an average with respect to the energy, and once you have uh, the, the mean energy, you invert for time. But this is not what you have to do. You have to first invert the time and then take the average in time. So the, the, the answer is not so simple. Now, but that's a calculation of, uh, of fixed times. <laughs> okay, so now uh, what you do to obtain uh, the, the mean half-life is the following. You redefine the function S, and you add an, in, an starting value, the small s, which is uh, arbitrary. So now the process S of t has been redefined in this way. Um, again, I call like this the distance to reach the value E1 when I start at the at small s. And this will be then the mean exit time of this interval. And I call this, it depends on both parameters. So I call this, I want to, to stress the dependence on small s, so I call this t of s, so big t of s, or however you want to call this. Now, it's very, from physical grounds, it's obvious that uh, this guy can only depend on the relative distance to the boundary that you want to, to attain. It's not going to depend separately on, on, on S and on B. And also, it solves this linear interval equation here. And this equation reflects the following, reflects the different possibilities that you may have after the first jump. So at the first jump, T1, if you introduce this time to the boundary for uniform motion, the process, I mean, three, you have three um, mutually excluding possibilities. Either the process has already exited the interval because of the trick, because of the constant motion, 
or it didn't, but then it escapes due to the jump, or neither of them. And in that case, the process uh, does not escape. And then notice that it's going to start afresh, like, um, but then the starting volume will not be a small s, but it's going to be this. Okay? And the exit time will be the exit time with this starting volume plus the time that has already elapsed. So, in mathematical terms, this reflects on this. The exit time can be written like this, where this is a heavy side function, and this reflects the three different possibilities. Now you average out this relationship, which is uh, involves random numbers, and then you obtain the relationship. So here is where I was pointing out. At T1, you, the process may have exit the, the, the interval. That would have happened if, if instead of this level, we would have something like this. Then here you go up. Or if you have a level like this, then the process will exit the interval at this point. And what has occurred here is that at T1, the process is, is still within this interval. It has not escaped. Now, the equation can be solved by Laplace transformation. Um, with, in terms of this notation, this is the exit time of the interval. So this is the solution we were looking for. Here I introduce a new parameter. And to obtain the half-life, just set small s to be 0. And let me remind you what b, how b is related with e1. And then this is the, 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 the half-life, the mean time to, for the energy to degrade to this value. And here is the implied that I gave you before. As you see, it's not correct. This term resembles very much this one, but it's not totally the same. And, but also you have here this correction. So, so the ex extra work <coughs> is worth uh, doing. I mean, you are obtaining an important correction from this, from this answer. Uh, they, are, they only coincide if lambda is zero. <coughs> they, in that case, they take this value. <coughs> it's quite easy to understand. If, there is no, if lambda is zero, there is no randomness. And if there is no randomness, you can, I mean, it's no problem. Um, also, if not lambda but gamma is zero, then you obtain a very neat answer, even here. Um, here, the mean exit time is the sum of two terms. This one is the mean uh, time for the first jump to, to happen, plus a new correction. <coughs> and the formula is, uh, makes sense. I mean, if there, are, if there is no drift, then you can exit the interval only due to the jumps. Okay? So the exit time must be one of the jumps. And therefore, it must be greater or equal than T1. So therefore, the mean uh, exit time is equals the mean of this plus what remains still, which is what this formula is, is telling. Okay, can be it's just a linear function in, in the very world. And finally, to finish, let me show you a few few graphs. Here I have plotted the, the mean exit time uh, with different parameters in red uh, for different values of gamma, and these are the blue and red curves. Okay. And here in the um, purple and green uh, colors are shown the incorrect implied formulas. And as you can see, if you compare, say, this and this, there is a, an important difference between the behavior given the actual behavior, which was the blue curve, and the implied behavior, this one, which is the, the, the that it is a wrong answer. And here is a comparison. Well, as you notice how the, in this case, there's a sharp behavior in the vicinity of the origin, which is not captured by this curve. So they are quite different. In this case, they are not that different, but still the different shows. Um, okay. Well, 
For a general distribution of gammas, can you use that the sun tends to adoption? To find the normal form? Can I use what? That the sun tends to adoption distribution of random absorbers. I'm not using that it's called. No, no, I mean, but the original particular form for the gamma distribution. So yeah. for general distribution of gamma. Yeah, here this is general. This is general, general. right. You're right. So th 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 this doesn't. Uh, I'm not making an assumption on, on the gamma sphere, only here when, when you evaluate this. Not, not there. I mean, it's. So to this problem, I, the, the four assumptions that I add in at the, at the end, you don't need for this problem. It's only when you go to this one and you have this integral equation, then unless you, you have the assumption on, on the gammas here, then this is going to be much more difficult to solve. But it still can be done. For general, for general distribution of gammas, you can solve it. Have you thought or uh, have you tried uh, with the vectorial nonlinear monetary equation? We are uh, now we are trying to generalize. Yeah, you could fix them by reference then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, I heard about this. It was someone in Kodama actually was in a conference was talking about this problem, but he just leave it there. This. And then I was talking with him, and then I realized that the problem could be solvable to obtain the solution of the energy. And then for me, it was some sort of divertimento to do this. I, I didn't, at first, I didn't uh, plan to, to make a follow up. Now, Mikhail is so happy with this kind of application that he's, we are actually doing several uh, follow up works on all this, but the kind of stuff we are doing is to assume that we put amplifiers on the fiber, which is different. It's still one dimensional fiber, but with amplifiers on it. And this is, um, also makes sense in optics, in uh, optical engineers, because you always have the gamma, the, the gamma and the energy is going to decay. So they, after a time, after a space, they, they wait, the signal is degraded. So and it's, not, uh, it's no longer good. So you have to restore the initial signal. So what uh, optical engineers do is to put a periodic, in a, in a periodic way to um, put amplifiers on the fiber. And so we are trying to generalize this in that uh, sense, either with amplifiers put in a periodic way or some other mechanisms. But Still one dimension. We have not considered the two dimensional case. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, the fiber is one D. It's one D, so uh, 
but I'm talking about vector is the new. Oh, vector. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Is the vector field. Yeah, vector field and then you can buy the fringes, which is important. The two components. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's very important in that case. No. I mean, there, there are many possibilities of that. But even without dissipation, this is not integral. It's not integral, yes. Yeah. Well, there is a case uh, in the two components which is integral, which is called the Alvovich uh, lab. Uh, mm. They are using uh, outfits. But again, uh, we don't need integrability. This would have integral. As long as you are able to obtain the evolution of the dynamics of the energy, that's all we need. But I don't know whether in these more general problems you will have this problem. Are there more questions to the speaker or questions to, to other people who are not speaking? <laughs> 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 if not, let's thank the speaker again.